のはここよトラちゃんにクッキーあげるんだまあじゃお目目をつぶって、うん If you're searching for an adorable and therapeutically relaxing anime, look no further than 1972's Panda Copanda, the precursor to future sensations like My Neighbor Totoro. Although the eventual co founders of Studio Ghibli made waves with this heartwarming experience, it's surprisingly born on the back of failure and embarrassment. Although I praised Isao Takahata's directorial debut in 1968's Horus of the Sun, its production complications and underwhelming box office results led to its demotion. Even Hayao Miyazaki noticed his future in Studio Toei was limited after even his friends avoided him in hallways. So naturally, if your talent isn't appreciated, you move on, and that's what they did. However, Miyazaki would face another embarrassment during the production of a Pippi Longstocking anime. While in Sweden to gain the author's permission, he was left waiting and ignored, effectively cancelling his adaptation. Thankfully, the trip wasn't wasted as he discovered countless inspirations for future anime, likely explaining his trademark European aesthetic. Despite the author's cold shoulder, Miyazaki moved forward with another project born from his Pippi Longstocking inspirations, creating the story for 1972's Panda Co Panda. The anime captures the same feeling of independence as Mimiko is left to fend for herself after her grandma leaves town for a memorial service. While most kids would destroy the house when left to their own devices, Mimiko is responsible enough to earn the town's respect. Ironically, alone time isn't what lies ahead as a family of cute, fluffy pandas wander across her cottage centered in a bamboo forest. Naturally, wholesome and playful shenanigans ensue as she assigns them human roles, turning Papa into her stereotypical Japanese father. <laughs> While familial roles of anime lead characters are a staple for the 60s and 70s as early as Astro Boy, I've never seen the relationship between their role, size, and personality extenuated to this extent. Previously, anthropomorphic characters were driven purely by their relationship between their animalistic traits and character design. However, in Panda, Papa's size and gentle nature work in tandem with his role, potentially replicating how a child would see their father as large and strong enough to accidentally break things while remaining loving and cuddly. The baby also lives up to his role of appearing weak and clumsy yet self-sacrificingly curious, inciting our natural desire to protect it. Additionally, the impact of size on cuteness is present even when the characters aren't, considering the staff's meticulous efforts in creating a living environment. I think it's here that Miyazaki perfected the formula for adorable characters, brimming with personality and never stopped making them. While Papa's archetype may have been an early version of Totoro, part of me wonders what his original influence was. After all, the biggest and cutest creature I've seen in earlier anime was the fluffy yokai from Gekike no Kitaro, which probably gave everyone nightmares. The feeling I get when watching Panda Co Panda under its historical context is that it stands out as a passive adventure. Previously, most anime followed characters charged with a task or victims of circumstance requiring that they resolve a problem. The pacing felt as if something always had to be happening. On the other hand, Panda Co Panda allows you to slow down and savor the moments between events by creating a living atmosphere with just as much personality as its characters. Take for example when Mimiko and her new panda family relax by a kerosene lamp on a mundane night. You're given the time to feel the warmth of the glowing flame and the closeness of characters who've become comfortable enough to enjoy their company in silence. 
However, the space between events isn't only about its calmness, as there's also lots of excitement in small pockets after an action, like when Mimiko pops a handstand on the kitchen table and the baby panda follows suit. All is well and good until Papa Panda decides to join in. Although the table confirms your expectations by shattering, you're still surprised by the kids unexpectedly catapulting through the air. <laughs> this same exaggeration takes me back to the first Puss in Boots movie Miyazaki also worked on. I remember it being refreshing for just how much happens in small scenes, like when Pedro fights the rats in its introduction and the environment itself becomes part of the fight. Miyazaki anime often feel like watching a spark in slow motion, where there's life and movement in every pocket of space, creating the impression that their world has a physics engine. The importance of a character's action in a scene unrelated to the overall plot seems just as important to Miyazaki as the action itself. They were probably aware that most would overlook a scene of Mimiko strolling up her lengthy dirt driveway. Still, they went above and beyond, creating three layers of scrolling parallax in addition to her fluid movements. I wrote this review focusing on historical context and personal observations because its plot leaves little to discuss. I always say that if there's nothing to spoil, then everything's a spoiler. I'm cautious about this because the spoiling factor is occasionally something besides the plot, and this is one of those cases. Despite its second episode getting a little intense with a harsh storm, its anime's greatest appeal is your emotional response to its mellow atmosphere and adorably wholesome characters. For that reason, I think I've given you enough information to decide if Panda Copanda is right for you. I give it an 8.5 out of 10. It's a great anime to relax to at the end of a hard day or even share with small children. Although you may find the anime in movie format, it was initially two episodes, the second coming the following year due to its popularity. Ironically, the anime coincidentally coincided with the improving relations between Japan and China, signified by the gift of two pandas to Japan. So I think it came out at the perfect time considering the Japanese audience was already more interested in pandas than they would have otherwise been. So in addition to its technical feats, I think Panda Co Panda should be seen as an inspiration to keep striving for your goals even when hope is lost because you never know how things will work out. Miyazaki and Takahata didn't predict this happening and it worked out great for them. As for my recommendations, I suggest my three favorite Yasujimori works from the 1950s, which redefined the nature of anime through its fluid and expressive character animations. First is Kapakawa Taro, for its groundbreaking animation for both characters and their environment. Second is the black and white woodcutter for the same reasons, but also because it's a compelling short silent film emphasizing the value of living in harmony with nature and others. Lastly, Cat Studio is a wild and comical short depicting the pitfalls of over-mechanization. Currently, these anime are available on YouTube and it takes less than an hour to watch them all. Thanks to everyone who supports these videos on Patreon, especially Nia-chan, for third tier support. If you'd like to join the ranks of supporters and get connected in other ways, check the links in the video description. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.